So this is a makeup uh, recording for us being a bit behind in part um, because I was also sick one day and I just want to make sure we're caught up uh, because of that. So today, Wednesday, March 8th, um, we started talking about Martin Luther King Jr. and didn't, weren't able to finish. So, <clears throat> excuse me, where we ended up was with Socrates in Crito. And I'll just put all three of these things down. This was, I think, the last slide that I showed. Because I wanted to compare Socrates in the Crito to Martin Luther King Jr. in this letter, which is also one of the essay topics, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Because it's something that you can uh, work on as well. But the basic idea is that for Socrates, if you have decided to live in a state that you could leave, then um, you are making an agreement to follow the laws. You can either obey them or try to change them, but you can't break them. And that's um, pretty clearly quite different from Martin Luther King Jr. But I also wanted to point out that for Socrates, the last bullet point, breaking the laws violates a just agreement and causes harm. And how that is the case. So how does it cause harm? Um, for Socrates in the Crito, he says, imagine the laws saying to us, if we were to, to break them and, and escape from jail, quote, this is page 91, does it seem possible to you that any city where the verdicts reached have no force, but are made powerless and corrupted by private citizens could continue to exist and not be in ruins, end quote. So the idea is that if if people can just go ahead and break the laws when they choose to, or they decide, I don't like the verdict that the court has reached, I'm just going to leave, um, that's going to cause harm to the laws itself. It's going to harm, cause harm to the state itself. If you thought that, that it was fine to just break the laws when you chose, then the laws aren't going to have any force anymore. Okay, but that's not the main issue here. I want to talk a little bit about the letter itself and start briefly with the statement of the Alabama clergyman who, uh, these are, I just pulled out three things that I think are kind of central to what they're saying. They're saying, okay, we agree that there are some really bad things happening, that segregation is wrong, that that should be changed, but we don't like the methods. We think that we should engage in negotiations, not violate the laws through, um, uh, let's say, sitting in the wrong places on buses like Rosa Parks did, or uh, going in and sitting down in restaurants where you're not supposed to sit, or blocking streets. They don't want you to, they don't want um, the civil rights movement people to be violating the laws. They want to negotiate and, and have things happen that way. So they should press issues in the courts, not in the street. And um, they should observe the principles of law. And I guess the thought is that they, you know, there will be, it will be more peaceful. They will actually get more things done. But that's, of course, what Martin Luther King is arguing against, that it's not always the case that that's the best way to operate. So the, the next couple of slides, I just have two more slides, um, are for Martin Luther King Jr. When is civil disobedience permissible? And... I think there's a few aspects of what he has to say in the letter that I just wanted to emphasize. One is nonviolent. So it has to be nonviolent for him. Um, and on my page nine, when I printed it out, he says, nonviolence demands that the means we use must be as pure as the ends we seek. And in another book that he wrote, uh, not in what we read, but in another one of his writings, he says that nonviolence is trying to win the friendship and understanding of the opponent so that you're, you're actually trying to get things done by bringing the other person with you. Um, so the nonviolent, again, from this other book, the nonviolent resistor not only refuses to shoot his opponent, but he also refuses to hate him. The resistor should be motivated by love, um, understanding, goodwill for all people. So the thought is that... Um, you're trying to, it's almost a form of negotiation with the other. You're, you're trying to get things to change, but do it in a way that isn't going to show hatred or um, disrespect by harming other people. So nonviolence is crucial. You need to accept the punishment. Um, you need to be willing to accept the punishment. And you need to engage in communication. 
those two, accepting punishment and communication, I found in a, I think a really helpful quote, which is on my page four when I printed it out. And the quote is, I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. So the thought is, actually, this combines a lot of aspects of civil disobedience that we talked about today. Conscience, so you're doing it in a conscious, conscientious way. So an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty in order to arouse the conscience of the community. That's the communicative aspect. You're engaging in communication with other people. So you're breaking the law to fit your conscience and to communicate the injustice of that law to others. But at the same time, you're willing to accept the penalty of imprisonment or accept the punishment of it. And he's claiming, again, returning to that quote, this is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. That you are wanting to communicate when you think the law is wrong that you are accepting the punishment when you break the law because you still respect the idea of law, right? But he also mentions four steps in uh, engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience. You collect evidence to see that just injustice exists. That's pretty clear in, uh, in you know, what we described as the history of segregation in the U.S. You try negotiation so what the Alabama clergyman had said you should do, he says, look, we tried that. We were trying to engage in negotiation with uh, city leaders or governors or um, other people who are engaged in the, the making of rules around segregation and that it wasn't working. We weren't getting anywhere. So if that's not going to work, then you have to move towards the last step, which is direct action. But for Martin Luther King Jr., if you're going to engage in um, Nonviolent civil disobedience. You have to engage in what he calls self-purification. You have to prepare yourself to do that well. You can't go into the direct action, the protest, with this hatred, according to, to him, in your mind of the other person. Because if you're going to be nonviolent, you have to be ready to respond in a passive way to what people are bringing to you. You have to be sure that you are not going to respond violently. So in another one of his writings, not what we read, he says about self-purification, quote, the cleansing of anger, selfishness, and violent attitudes from the heart and soul in preparation for a nonviolent struggle. So you have to get rid of anger, selfishness, and violent attitudes in order to actually be nonviolent. So once you've purified yourself, then you can engage in your direct action. But the point of direct action is to get back to the point where you can do negotiation. So it's to force negotiation. If negotiation wasn't working, then you need to engage in direct action to try to get the negotiation to happen. And that direct action can be um, sit-ins where you block uh, uh, buildings, you block entrances to things, maybe you block a street, to uh, sitting on the places in the bus where you're not supposed to sit, to um, uh, having demonstrations where you haven't gotten permission to do so, to sitting in the wrong places in, in restaurants, all of that would count as direct action. And on my page two, when I printed out the letter to, uh, for Birmingham jail, he says, quote, Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. So you're supposed to do direct action in order to get to negotiation. And then from there, you can hopefully work towards lasting change. Last slide is the one I showed uh, at the very end of class, actually. So when is civil disobedience permissible? That you can do it when... Um, there are unjust laws, so the red here, and the unjust laws are the ones that don't fit with moral rules, which he then associates with the laws of God because he's a Christian, um, he's a Christian minister, actually. So 
who, which ones are going to count as just and which ones are going to count as unjust is going to depend on what you think the moral rules are, right? So the crucial aspect here, and this is where we ended, was, you know, how do you determine what those moral rules are and therefore which laws you can break, which are the unjust laws, and which laws you must follow, which are the just laws. And I was going to leave you today with um, the question of, which of the texts have we read that could help you answer what, how do you decide what the moral rules are? Um, how to treat people? What are the just and unjust ways of treating people? Um, and I think Mill is obvious because Mill is talking specifically about how we determine what morality is. But I think there might be, um, there might be a way to think about this with Nussbaum as well. Because Nussbaum would say, if a law is such that it's not fulfilling um, those, those 10 capacities for certain groups of people, then that's going to be unjust. Um, she doesn't put it quite that way, but I think you could potentially use her view in that way because treating people with human dignity, giving them those 10 capacities are um, crucial to treating them like human beings, which would be the moral thing to do.